to may I please invite Shri P. Vasudevan, Executive Director, Reserve Bank of India, and Mr. Christopher Waller, Member, Federal Reserve Board of Governors of the United States. Can we have a thundering round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Let's bring the energy back in the air and let's all gear up to hear from two of our esteemed leaders. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. And on that note, let's deep dive into this very pertinent conversation coming your way. With that, over to you, sir. Good morning, Mumbai. Good morning, GFF. Nice to be back here. Nice to be on stage as well. Uh, just now, we had a wonderful intro about what the GFF is all about and what are all the things that are online for the next couple of days. And to kickstart, I'll be part of this fireside chat. I was just wondering, early in the morning on a working, busy working day, we are talking about fireside. And uh, of course, Mumbai is a little cool, but not as cool as Bangalore, where we were a uh, day before. So I was just wondering why. But then I realized that uh, when uh, the US President Roosevelt was giving an interview, it was by a, the side of a fireplace. So from then on, it's, the fireside chat has started and we are picking up the tradition. It's my pleasure to be part of this session with uh, the big man, the uh, governor and member of the board of governors of the Federal Reserve System, uh, Mr. Christopher Waller. Governor Waller has been very gracious in accepting our invite and to be part of this. He is having multiple responsibilities on the board of the Fed Reserve System. He is the economist there. In addition to that, he also is, the, is in charge of the oversight function for the payments clearing and then the financial market infrastructures. It's a great honor, uh, Governor Waller, to have you here. And we will have uh, a couple of questions after the governor gives his address, so what I will do is, in the interest of time, I will request Governor to come and give his opening address and remarks, and thereafter we'll have a few questions to uh, discuss. If that's fine, kindly come over to the podium, Governor. A big round of applause, please. Well, good morning. That's what I like to hear, an interactive audience. So I want to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to speak this year at the Global FinTech Fest, a place where there is so much payments innovation. The technology-driven payments revolution in India has been enabled by a public-private partnership to build the technology stack of digital platforms that has broadened financial inclusion and done so at low cost. Building on the foundation established by the public sector, innovators in the private sector seize the opportunity to enhance payments through the introduction of new capabilities that allevi alleviate frictions while remaining within regulatory guardrails. In today's remarks, I'm going to touch on how the interplay between public and the pri public sec private sector may be the key to advancing cross-border payments. Now that fast payment systems have been established around much of the globe in over 70 countries and counting, attention is turning to how these newer systems could potentially enhance global payments as opposed to just local. Specifically, interlinking fast payment systems has been identified as a possible means to deliver enhanced cross-border payments for consumers and businesses. Interlinking arrangements would allow banks in different countries who are users of domestic fast payment systems to send payments to each other through technical connections through their respective domestic payment systems. As you all know, interlinking is one of the areas outlined in the G20 roadmap for further exploration as part of a holistic effort to enhance cross-border payments. The overarching G20 goal is to mitigate challenges with cross-border payments in a coordinated way at a global level with input from key stakeholders, including the private sector. 
The G20 roadmap addresses a new topic that payments industry stakeholders have been circling around for years, more cost-effective and timely cross-border payments for consumers and businesses. This policy goal has been advanced by the Federal Reserve over time in various payment system improvement initiatives dating back to the late 1990s when the Federal Reserve began adapting an automated clearinghouse, or ACH, service to support international payments. And more recently, in 2015, when we collaborated with industry to improve the U.S. payment system. Today's consumers and businesses can generally send a payment anywhere in the world, but they all seem to want faster and cheaper global payments, just like we always want faster flights, fewer connections, and cheaper airfares. However, I'm not entirely convinced that interlinking arrangements will necessarily deliver on those goals. So let me explain with some context. Now, first of all, not all frictions that slow payments down are bad. We have to get that straight. Certain frictions are purposefully built into the global payment system for compliance and risk management reasons. Slowing down the speed at which payments are cleared and settled helps banks prevent money laundering and countering, counter the financing of terrorism, detect fraud, and recover fraudulent or misdirected cross-border payments. Now granted, the practice today of sending payments through an often complex chain of correspondent banks contributes to slower payments that could benefit from efficiency enhancements. However, there is no silver bullet that increases speed and efficiency without trade-offs, what every economist always talks about. Unless new solutions are found, interlinking fast payment systems might increase the risk management burden for banks that participate in them. That is, legal, compliance, and operational considerations are critical to the discussion of the promise and challenges of interlinking. Governance, oversight, and settlement arrangements also need to be thought through along with considerations for data privacy. Now, in addition, can we assume that all parties to a cross-border payment want faster payments? I've studied monetary theory for a long time, which is about the exchange and payments of money for goods and services. And what you've learned is that the fundamental friction or tension in any transaction is that the seller of an object, whether it's a can of soup, an hour of your labor, or a good manufactured for export, that seller wants to receive their money as fast as possible. However, the buyer of the object or the buyer's intermediary often has incentives to wait as long as possible to make that payment. Now, under this logic, if you think about wanting to have faster payments, what you have to do is incentivize the sender of the payments. You do not need to incentivize the receiver of the payment. We all want our money faster, but we need to get people to send it faster. So one of the exceptions where the sender does want to send things faster are person-to-person -person remittances where workers from other countries want to send money home and recipients want access as fast as possible to those funds. But remittances are only a small percentage of the value of global cross-border payments. <coughs> so we need to weigh the benefits against the cost of a potential public center intervention to shift incentives. So I'm still left with the larger question of whether we should be incentivizing faster cross-border payments. But suppose we do want to incentivize senders by lowering costs of faster payments. Whose responsibility is, is it to do that? Should it be left to private sector competition to drive down costs, as is typically done with nearly every other product that we trade in our lives? 
Or is there something unique about payments that requires central banks or payment system operators to step in to interlink their networks with the goal of bringing costs down? We have already seen examples of the private sector leveraging technology to innovate in the market for cross-border instant payments, both at the wholesale and the retail level. For example, we have seen a real-time payment system built for wholesale clients that allows clearing and settlement between global clients in seconds, with necessary compliance performed up front in less than 24 hours. Another example is the SWIFT global payments innovation, which offers improved speed and transparency for the business customers of participating banks, and by their account, has been adopted by 150 banks globally. In mentioning these examples, I'm not intending to adore certain private sector services. Rather, these newer services are illustrative how market forces and competition can meet consumer and business demands for more efficient cross-border payments. In the United States, we have experience with offering low-cost international ACH payments. We provided direct ACH linkages from the United States to Europe and Canada, but after more than 20 years, the banks were simply not using it, and we stopped the service. It is possible that a fast payment interlinking arrangement adopted by the Federal Reserve could be more effective for our bank customers than the former ACH service. But we would proceed cautiously and carefully to consider the cost and the benefits. Economic viability needs to be a cornerstone for any economic action that we take. We need to ask ourselves whether banks would find a central banking interlinking service more effective than their existing re arrangements for cross-border payments, and if they would actually use it. Now, we know from basic economic theory that payment systems are similar to other networks in that greater participation is necessary for the network to grow and increase value to its users. This is true on a global scale. Two, which in practical terms means that valuable global interlink networks would have to be founded on underlying domestic networks with the breadth of senders and receivers. Domestic networks must be developed first. If this condition is not in place, interlink networks would end up being a road to nowhere. Building out domestic networks has been done in different ways. In some countries, the central bank has authority to mandate participation, notably in Brazil, with a successful PIC system. In other countries, notably India, united efforts by the government, the central bank, and the private sector established the digital public infrastructure that enabled broad adoption and the huge success of UPI. In the United States, however, it's a different story. And the payments landscape for us is unique compared to other countries. We have over 9,000 depository institutions and different authorities than other countries. The Federal Reserve is determined that, determined that it was needed to build a fast payment system accessible to all depository, all 9,000, to achieve our policy goals. At the time of our decision, there was only one private sector instant payment system in the market, built by the largest banks. Based on our experience, we did not believe that this system would ultimately reach all depository institutions, nor would other private sector systems emerge to compete with it and extend the scope of that service. Yet we knew from industry engagement that smaller banks across the U.S wanted a broadly accessible fast payment system. So we stepped in to address what was a clear coordination problem in the market. This action is very much consistent with the Federal Reserve's role in the U.S. payment system for the last 110 years. 
Now, we have seen widespread adoption of our fast payment system, the FedNowSys, or service, in just a little over a year since implementation, with close to 1,000 depository institutions on the network, including many of the largest banks that will drive origination volume. Yet we are still in the beginning of a multi-year journey of establishing a ubiquitous network covering the majority of institutions in our country. Variation, variation around the globe in domestic fast payment network adoption means that the value of globally interlinked systems is not yet clear. From a technical perspective, the promise of interlinking, which is essentially interoperability between or among domestic fast payment systems, is that fast payment networks can just connect. You just get the right adapter, you plug them together, you put some tape around them and turn it on. Okay, this sounds simple, but in practice, however, achieving interoperability is not simple. It <clears throat> Technology is probably the easiest part of setting up a globally interconnected payment system. The legal, compliance, settlement, and governance challenges I mentioned earlier are far more substantial. In addition, even when technological connections are in place, payments not, may not actually be instant as they traverse across systems because of domestic variations in ISO 20022 implementation, which is the global standard used by most fast payment systems. To send an ISO message seamlessly from one country to the other, operators need to coordinate and align on common messaging standards. We should consider that new multilateral arrangements for interlinking could potentially address some of the challenges I have outlined. Today, certain countries have established bilateral links between domestic fast payment systems, primarily to support remittances payments. These arrangements demonstrate that linkages are technically possible and that legal and compliance issues can be addressed. Yet each, each link is unique and requires resource-intensive negotiation and alignment between parties. Establishing bilateral links, linkages, where each arrangement required bespoke agreements with correspondent banks and service providers. Multilateral arrangements might bring some efficiencies, yet they are no small undertaking. So to sum up, overall, I do see the value of a coordination role for the public sector to improve cross-border payments, an effort in which the Federal Reserve has been and will continue to be heavily engaged. We will continue our engagement with the International Fora to improve the speed and efficiency of cross-border payments and to investigate the issues critical to interlinking payment systems. Our chief focus in the near to midterm, however, is continuing to build our FedNow network domestically and increasing participation in that service. We are also improving cross-border rails by considering expanding operating hours for our large value real-time gross settlement system, the Fedwire Funds Service, and by adopting ISO 20022, a globally accepted messaging standard. Looking out over the longer term, we will continue to conduct research and experimentation on emerging technologies, to better understand the role these innovations could play in the payments landscape of the future. I expect the technical capabilities, legal infrastructure, and use cases for faster cross-border payments will evolve. And I look forward to allowing, following the private sector innovation that will emerge from stakeholders represented at this event. Thank you very much. Well, that was indeed insightful. In a short time of 10 to 12 minutes, Governor Waller has been able to present the entire payments landscape in the US, as also the 
the pillars on which the interlinking of payment systems, especially the fast payment systems in various domestic countries like Brazil, India, etc., they need to be focusing on very important aspects about the legal compliance and the governance risks that need to be addressed. And uh, Governor Waller, you also mentioned about what are all the things that you are planning building on the Fed now, rails as well. So it's very interesting. But uh, I want to actually ask you about the audience here and your uh, presence in Mumbai and of course in India. How does it feel to be in India for the first time? And of course in this GFF at Mumbai, I will take it as your maiden exposure or experience. Can you just share your thoughts please? Yeah, it's a pleasure to come to India, of course, having oversight of the Federal Reserve payment system. I've learned a lot about various payment systems around the world, particularly UPI here in India. Uh, so it was a pleasure yesterday to spend three to four hours at uh, in the NPCI and learn a lot about UPI, how it was built, how it was done, what are the objectives, and the success that it's had, particularly in bringing more formalization to the business sector by having lots of small merchants suddenly connected to this larger payment system. So it's been a pleasure and then I, I love hearing how fintechs are going to improve, expand, and deliver greater service to everybody. So it was a great pleasure and I look forward to my conversations the next two days. Thank you. Governor Waller, you have been a student of economics. You have been teaching economics. Now, I also know that you have done extensive research on different theories in economics as well. And now you are a practicing economist. And you did mention about your responsibility for oversight over payments and financial market infrastructures at the Fed. And you also chair the Fed's Payments Clearing and Settlements Committee. I just thought I will ask you about what's your general view on the payment system developments and the role of the Fed. I know, uh, Governor, you mentioned about uh, the 110 year history and uh, your thoughts about how the cost and other expectations of the private and the public sector should be met. But that was, I thought, a short time window which you had there. Maybe if you could dwell deeper, what, what's the role of the Fed and uh, your particular interest in payment system developments? Yeah, so the Federal Reserve, when it was created in 1913, one of its roles was to improve the speed and efficiency and safety of the U.S. payment systems in 1913. So from our founding, Congress in the United States recognized it was important for the Federal Reserve to make the payment system in the United States better, faster, safer. And we have done that for 100 years. And as technology has evolved, those payment systems have developed, and the Federal Reserve has always been there to help work to improve the safety and efficiency of the U.S. payment systems, along with the private sector. Uh, that's really critical for us, is to work with the private sector to make sure, because it is a network and they have to participate in that network for it to be a success. So that is one of the things that has always been part of the Federal Reserve's history, and we'll continue doing that forward now with our Fed now, improving our Fed uh, wire services. My own interest has just been the fact that I did monetary theory all my life, which is I go buy something from somebody, I give them currency. Why do I have to give them currency? Why can't I simply buy it on credit? Just give it to me, I'll pay you back later. Eh, there's always some problems with that. So a lot of what I did for 25 years was simply study what are the frictions in payments that require certain instruments or certain payment mechanisms to successfully trade and then also transfer the goods from the seller to the buyer? So when I took over uh, the payment system, this was something I'd been thinking about studying for 25 years. So it came very naturally to me, and I actually have you know, great interest in actually the topics. Uh, I often laugh when I think about payments today and the fintechs that are all here 25 years ago, if you'd have told me that payments would be the coolest tech job in the planet, nobody would have believed you. But it is. I mean, there's something like 50 to 100,000 people here today, all basically dealing with payments. And it's cool and young and exciting to young people. No one would have ever thought that 25 years ago. So that's why I actually find it a fascinating uh, industry to be working in and studying right now. 
Thank you. Very, very interesting perspectives, Governor. We did hear about the FedNow launch. I know it was in July 2023 and it was launched. And you have almost 9,000 depository institutions that need to come on board. Probably 1,000 of them are already on board. I know it must have been very difficult to motivate them to come on board the FedNow. I just want to hear your thoughts about um, what went into when the FedNow was being uh, conceptualized and now launched. And what are the plans you have in the next couple of years? Can you just tell us in a little more detail, please? Yeah, so in 2015, the, there was an initiative to improve the payment system in the U.S. with faster, certainly retail payments. And the Federal Reserve acted as the kind of coordinator of industry uh, discussions of how to do that. And we were really encouraging the private sector to take this on and do it. Um, and the largest banks did take up that challenge, and they built what's called the Real-Time Payments Network from the largest banks in the U.S. The problem we heard was a lot of the smaller banks were kind of worried about belonging to this network run by the largest banks. And so they wanted another network. Now, my response typically would be, well, then you go build one. We, the big banks built theirs, you go build yours. But when you're sitting there with, say, 8,900 banks who all now have to coordinate and somehow figure out how to build their own real-time payment or fast payment network, it's a massive coordination problem. And they all looked at us and said, well, we're already connected to you for payments. Why don't you just build it for the rest of us? So I often view creating FedNow as a solution to a large market failure in the sense that we could not get 8,900 banks to coordinate and build their own system. It's just a market failure problem. So we started building the FedNow system, and we finally launched it last year, and we have about 1,000 banks that have now signed up. But as I said, there's roughly 9,000 banks. This is a long process to get all of these banks hooked up. So if UPI would somehow connect to FedNow, and you want to send a payment from the U.S. to India or vice versa, most of the banks in the U.S. are not connected. The payment's going to go nowhere. So that's what I mean. We have to take time to build out our network before we seriously think that it's going to be of value to every other fast payment network in the U.S. And that'll just take some time. But we're hoping to get there in the next few years. Thank you, uh, Governor. You did mention about the poster payment system of India, that's the UPI. And uh, let me just tell you a few numbers, like for the last month, uh, UPI cleared 14.4 billion in number of transactions, and uh, it was for the value of US dollar 245 billion. It's really an inclusive system with more and more features being added, more and more user base getting on it. Uh, you also did mention about the interlinking expectations and the possibilities as well. Just was curious, could there be any timeline where we can see UPI and FedNow getting linked, uh, and what could be the motives that we can, or motivations that we can look at for such a linkage? Yeah, so that's what I was saying. Right now, we just don't have enough banks connected to make it a full service product. Now, we do have a private sector real time payments, which is another thing that UPI should be looking to connect to, not just FedNow. That's up and running, but it doesn't have quite the same number of banks, but it has all the largest banks. We have a lot of the large banks, but not necessarily all of them on the FedNow network. So the whole value chain is when every, like with UPI, all the banks are connected. And when they're all connected, you can move a payment from one bank or another person, easy. But if those banks aren't connected, the payment goes nowhere. And so the value proposition just isn't quite there yet. So that's why what I try to conveyed everybody's, the Federal Reserve is fully behind the global faster, cheaper payments and connecting these things. But until you have a functioning domestic payment network, there's no value proposition in connecting. It's just not gonna do anything. So that's the critical thing I try to stress. You just have to give us time to get ours up and running. There is the real-time payment system in the, with the private sector in the US. Uh, but again, you're not gonna get the ubiquitous reach because they only have about 600 banks attached to that one. So it's just gonna take time because of our unique situation with 9,000 depository institutions. Thank you indeed, uh, sounds very 
much a future we can look forward to when the two systems can talk to each other and more banks will be on board on both sides as well. You know, uh, Governor, in the Indian context, we have plenty of many fintechs, and many of them are present here as well. And we have many of the startups who are getting into the financial services space. And they are always a little uncomfortable when it comes to the regulatory and the supervisory expectations of central bankers. I am from the Reserve Bank of India, so sometimes they do have a little bit of hesitation to come close to me as well. So that's, that's a concern and fear they have. But uh, no, the banks and the well-established traditional lending lenders, in the Indian context, the non-banking financial companies, they are used to the central banker being there, regulations being there. And they feel that to have a level playing field, even the fintechs could probably have to be regulated more closely. One of the things we have been looking at is to have some sort of a self-regulation so by setting up a self-regulatory organization. It should be set up by the fintechs as well. Now, uh, Governor, you were mentioning about the huge uh, presence of depository institutions. Many of them are massive in terms of size and operations. What do you have in terms of uh, guidance and suggestion for the fintech sector? How do you think we should approach them? What do you have as a guidance to them, if you could just mention? Yeah, so typically bank rate, banks do a wide range of financial services and activities. And when you regulate banks, you have to kind of take the whole package into account. Fintechs often will take one slice of an activity that a bank does. It's not really a bank because it only does this one piece. Now, one of the principles in bank regulation is typically the idea is same activity, same risk, same regulation. Whether it's a fintech or a bank, if you're doing this activity, you should be facing the same kind of demands from regulatory and supervisory structure. So I think that's the first thing you have to remember. If you're doing something that a bank does and you're doing it with the same risk, don't be surprised if you're expected to have the same regulatory structure and compliance. But there is that difference I just mentioned where banks are a bundle of activities and you often have to take into account how those different interact, those variety of activities are interlinked in terms of the way it affects the safety and soundness of a bank that you don't necessarily have to worry about with fintechs. So there is some scope to have some slightly different approaches to the banks versus the fintechs, but I think this general principle of same activity, same risk, same regulation kind of applies around the world. Uh, it's really wonderful to hear these views, uh, Governor. You know, the Global Fintech Festival is in its fifth edition, and it has been in Mumbai so far. And going by the word global as part of the name, probably very soon we will be short of space here as well, and we might look at coming to Las Vegas or somewhere for the next edition of the Global Fintech Fest. That will be truly global, and will also definitely add the vibrancy and the mischievousness that is there attached to the GFF. So that's what we are looking forward to. In a short time, Governor, you have really taken us through the landscape of payments in the U.S. You have put all your knowledge and wealth behind telling us your perspectives. And you've also given a positive hope to all of us present here that we will see the linkage happen between FedNow and UPI. Maybe it may take a little while, but we'll hope it happens faster, especially for many of the Indians there and the monies that are going to come in from there. It will become faster, cheaper, and quickly as well. Many thanks for your presence here. And ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big round of applause to Governor Waller. We wish you many more visits to India and to GFF going forward, Governor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Take care.